<laughs> All right, let's see here. Hello there. Sorry, I've been uh, answering messages here. Um, hello to you, Wesley, Aubrey, Amon. Hello to you all. doing very well on my end over here. I finished up uh, doing the lesson for today, as well as grading your exams from last week. I've had a very productive day. Hello there, Naomi. Um, so yeah, it's been a busy day, but it's been a productive one. And I got about 45 minutes to uh, practice on the old synthesizers. So I have to say that I'm feeling pretty good about feeling pretty good about today overall, I must admit. Uh well folks, uh it is two fifty eight. We have eight current viewers. I have to admit, it does sound very nice. Um Henry and I are in the midst of creating a live set for Recursive Resonance, and we are going to be broadcasting a live set. Um, and 
Hello there, Nehemiah. Hello to you and Naomi. That's cool. You play piano. I started off on piano myself. Ooh, Nord Electro or Nord, Nord Stage 3. That is a really nice keyboard. The thing that's nice about those Nords is they um, pretty faithfully replicate um, the Hammond B3 organ, which is a really cool sound. Um, but those Nords are nice. They do a good job of um, recreating like old Fender Rhodes sounds and stuff like that. I've never had a Nord, but the reason I haven't had one is because they're really expensive. They're like 2200 bucks or something like that. They're not cheap. And so, um, but yeah, um, they're really nice instruments. Those are really, really nice. Um, I've known a lot of musicians who have played those over the years. I have uh, like 6,000 synthesizers, but anyhow, um, yeah, what I was going to mention is that's awesome. That is really awesome. Better give dad a big birthday hug for that because that's a sweet gift. No one buys me gifts except for myself, <laughs> which is the privilege of being an adult is I just buy myself presents and it's always something I want, turns out. <laughs> so anyway, <laughs> uh, all right. So um, yeah, what I was going to say is Henry and I are in the midst of um, making this live set for Recursive Resonance. And uh, so it's going to be broadcast live. And then to answer your your previous question about when the music video drops, that comes out November 17th, at least. That's the, like the tentative drop date. But yeah, November 17th is when we're looking at having the music video release. Um, invite Henry to the AP Research Zoo. <laughs> I don't think Henry wants to come to it, AP Research Zoo. I could just assure you of that. But uh, spoiler alert for tomorrow. Um, spoiler alert for tomorrow is that... Uh, we will be having a special guest in one Mr. Harris, who has agreed to come and say hello to uh, the research class for tomorrow. So he'll be a special guest for tomorrow, not to ruin the surprise. Um, but yeah, Mr. Harris is going to join us. Yeah, so that'll be fun. And it'll be cool for you guys to be able to talk to him again. I'm sure you haven't seen him in a while. All right, with, enough with that. Let's go ahead and uh, get started talking about today's lesson, which is, to be honest with you, um, the, the amount that I lectured on last time cut off about the last four pages of the chapter because I, I knew I was going to run out of time because the PowerPoint was getting lengthy. And so the first part of this PowerPoint today is actually going to be, uh, oh, I already downloaded it. Whoopsie daisy. Um, the first part of this PowerPoint is going to be actually the last four pages of um, of talking about um, the life of slaves in the South in the antebellum period. And then um, it will kind of seamlessly trans over to the start of chapter six. So this is just the last little bit of chapter five. And then the majority of today's lecture will be pertaining to what your reading assignment was for today, which was uh, the first part of chapter six. So without further ado, let's jump into it. And um, I'm going to minimize this and open this back up so that I can see comments. Um, <laughs> me and the homies love the H, man. <laughs> I'm going to tell him you said that. Now, um, Mr. Harris is cool. I like Mr. Harris a lot. He's a nice guy. Um, all right, so um, like I said, the name of this chapter is Northern Black Freedom Struggles and the Coming of the Civil War. But uh, let's just finish up what we were talking about last time, looking at gender, age, and work uh, in the South. Now, where education was forbidden, which was throughout all of the South, or in, even in the North, we'll say, where education was out of reach, um, family structures allowed slaves in the South or free men in the North uh, to pass on wisdom, knowledge, and skills to the next generations. And slave elders, typically the older populations, particularly older women, played an important role in educating the community and also often acted as spiritual leaders. Um, and, you know, spiritual leaders could be men or women, but particularly within the family unit, within the household, women played a very significant role 
um, role in African American communities, where uh, by comparison to white communities, women in white communities typically saw their roles reduced uh, in in and their legal and property rights reduced in the name of white male patriarchy, and so. Um, but it, but women in African American communities, black communities, both in the North and the South, tended to play a little bit more um, equal uh, status in the household as men. But particularly in the South, in in slave families, um, and uh, so literacy, of course, was outlawed in the South, which meant that very few of these elders in the African American community knew how to teach the youth how to read and write. Those are not the kinds of skills we're talking about imparting. Instead, the kinds of um, things that they taught their kids were, for example, how to handle their owners, okay? How to negotiate with white overseers, how to resolve disputes within their quarters, in other words, within their living situations. And older slaves had a tendency to teach younger ones also agricultural techniques that were used on the plantations, as well as, remember, due to the um, pittance of food that slaves were typically given um, each week, uh, you know, the, the, they needed to supplement their diets by doing other things like foraging and hunting and fishing and stuff. And so these would be other survival skills that elder populations would teach youth. They also, particularly for, for girls, uh, for women, women would teach girls how to cook, how to sew, how to clean, how to take care of kids. Um, sometimes even teach them how to help when another woman is giving birth. And so these are the kinds of life skills, if you will, uh, that African-American adults taught to their kids. And... Um, Frederick Douglass even, uh, if you recall, mentioned that his own grandmother was not only a skilled nurse, but also, a, as he put it, a capital hand at making nets for catching shad and herring. And shad and herring are just different types of fish. But she made fishing nets. And he also mentioned that she was equally good as using the net at sh as she was at making it uh, to catch the fish. And so when we see these kinds of things, it's, you know, women and men frequently in African-American slave communities in the South um, had a tendency to have some overlap, okay? In other words, the roles of men and women slaves um, were not always strictly divided on gender. Now, sometimes they, they were, um, but oftentimes men and women shared uh, responsibilities within the house, and it would not have been uncommon to see women foraging for food or doing fishing or other things like that. Um, men and women both worked in the fields, but other tasks may be more divided by gender as uh, field hands uh, by 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 declaration of the slave owner, field hands were usually split into sex-segregated work gangs and assigned different tasks. So in terms of the labor that they were performing on the actual plantation, that was typically segregated, and the different tasks that they would do during their work day would have been delegated by the overseer or the slaveholder. Uh, and so, or the, whatever, supervisor, even if it wasn't the person who owned the slaves, whoever was su supervising the slaves that day would delegate the tasks out between men doing this and women doing that. Uh, women were classified as three quarters of a field hand, and what that means is a, a, a full field hand would have been designated to uh, a slave male. Um, women received uh, a classification of only three quarters of a hand. And on plantations with many male workers, um, women were usually spared some of the most demanding labor. And that's in part because, first of all, men are stronger, uh, but also, too, thanks to the kind of patriarchal gender roles going back to feudal Europe, where farming was considered a man's job and doing other things was considered women's work. And so those kinds of practices on large plantations where there were a lot of men um, tended to result in women doing less of those really arduous, demanding type tasks. 
Um, if additional labor was needed, female slaves could, though, be assigned to do other work, which would have included, at that point, mon some of the more grueling type of work. And this is particularly common in Louisiana. In Louisiana, uh, sugar plantations uh, in Louisiana had a tendency uh, to employ female slaves in all of the same kind of grueling work that men were doing in the sugar plantations, working as many as 60 to 70 hours a week, which is just a tremendously long and difficult work week. Um, and the type of work that they're performing, of course, is, is back-breaking labor. Um, extreme work performed by women, though, does have a negative effect on their health, as you could imagine, particularly in terms of conceiving children, delivering babies, nurturing infants that perhaps had been born healthy but now need to be taken care of. And as a result, one of the things that happens in areas where women were forced to do the most grueling labor is we saw the numbers of stillbirths and miscarriages uh, increase and they tended to be pretty commonplace in in um, areas where women were doing the most arduous labor and these losses of course aside from the pure physical aspect you also have to remember that they have a severe impact on one's own mental health um, you know the body and the mind are connected and so you know there are a couple of examples of this that the that the book points out for example a slave woman named Rachel who worked on a Louisiana plantation gave birth to nine children before 18 between 1836 and 1849 but only four of her nine children survived and you can only imagine what it would be like particularly if you go very late term in your pregnancy or you give birth and then your child dies shortly thereafter about the level of um, sadness that that would bring and depression and um, mental and emotional anguish that accompanies losing a child, right? And um, not, never mind just one child would be bad enough, but then to lose five children would, of course, complicate that significantly. Another slave, Edward Debu, recalled um, in his own words, my ma died about three afters I was born. Um, and she was hoeing sugar cane when she went into labor. And she told, the, and according to um, Edward Debu, she told the slave driver she was sick. He told her to just hoe right on. Soon I was born and my ma died a few minutes after they brung her to the house. So, you know, these kinds of really punishing work regimes really very much interfered all the way up to and including the moment at which, uh, you know, the slave woman gave birth in some cases. Uh, planters in most cases, with the exception of Louisiana, generally though, did have a vested interest in encouraging slave reproduction. So some slaveholders, uh, particularly on smaller plantations, tended to reduce the work requirements of pregnant pregnant and nursing women, or in some case, even increase, e increased their food allotment um, to encourage healthy pregnancies and the birth of, of more slave children. And of course, this became an increasingly uh, common occurrence, uh, natural reproduction of slaves to increase the slave population became increasingly na um, commonplace in this era because by this point, the international slave trade had already been shut down. And so there were no new uh, slaves from Africa being uh, forced migrated across the ocean. Instead, uh, American plantation owners relied on the existing slave population to produce more kids. And these measures tended to help maintain a high rate of production, uh, reproduction rather, throughout much of the antebellum South. Many slave old owners, oddly, thought that black women were naturally immune to the rigors of pregnancy, which of course meant that they could treat um, black women more harshly during a pregnancy by putting them to work. Uh, and, and these same kinds of, um, you know, it, it, it's, there is no difference in terms of like uh, the, the natural health of women who are in um, you know, at least based on race, there's no differences in, in like, you know, um, pregnant or nursing women's, you know, difficulties in terms of having kids. It's, it's, 
it's physically demanding. And so it doesn't matter what color skin you have, but slave owners, um, you know, whereas white women were regularly confined to their beds for months, either before uh, they gave birth or after they gave birth, that same kind of um, treatment was not considered um, necessary for black women. So slaveholders often accused black women of faking, quote unquote, illness or, quote, playing the lady, referring to wealthy white women, mis you know, white mistresses of, of um, slave owners, okay, playing the lady when they complained of uh, pain or fatigue, uh, you know, as a byproduct of, of giving birth or, or being pregnant. And, you know, yet worse would be when other slaveholders would simply whip pregnant slaves who, um, who complained of, of health issues uh, as a regard of the, as a, in regards to their pregnancy. Most new slave mothers uh, were sent back to work very shortly after birth. And that meant that slave women had to juggle infant care, which itself is basically a full-time job, as well as a grueling labor regime. And when you think about modern day laws regarding um, you know, maternity leave and stuff like that, if you guys know at the high school, Mrs. Cabal uh, just, just gave birth to a, a you know, brand new baby back in September. And, um, you know, she's, she's returning to work coming up here soon, but she needed time to be able to take off of work to, um, you know, be with her, her newborn, you know, and we look at that as being perfectly normal. But slave women weren't afforded those kinds of time away to be able to, first of all, nurse their children and take care of cranky babies, but also, you know, just in terms of recuperating health-wise. And so some field working women were allowed no time to nurse and were forced to carry their infants with them in the fields. And we talked about that story with William Wells Brown's mother uh, who had to do that with him. Women also performed though, beyond, beyond the infant care and the grueling labor regime working on the plantations, they also performed much of the domestic labor in the slave quarters after the actual work day got done. So slave women had a tendency to look out for one another, take care of one another, um, and also develop a sense of independence that made them more similar to their husbands than most antebellum wives of white uh, males. Okay, and free men of the era, you know, another difference between men and women, dependent on if you were either a slave or if you were a free person, either white or, or black free person, Free men of the era had considerable power over their wives' behavior and possessions, in particular with relation to um, inheritance laws and other things like that. But enslaved men had very little authority over slave women, and gender norms in slave homes tended to recognize black men and women as equal partners with similar abilities. And that kind of egalitarian relationship between men and women uh, where we see actually in some senses a very matriarchal society where women tend to have a lot of influence inside uh, you know, the black home, uh, particularly though in slave families as opposed to free uh, black families. But nonetheless, these gender norms were slightly more egalitarian and that's very different from um, white populations of America at that time, which were very patriarchal and male dominated where father the father figure was the head of the household. Looking more closely at marriage and family, Southern courts did not recognize slave marriages because according to the slave codes, slaves were, quote, according to the law, not ranked among sentient beings, but among things, and things are not married. That's the literal verbiage of the law, and I want you to consider that we are describing human beings here, okay? And they are, they are legally relegated to the position of chattel slaves, meaning they are property. They are not sentient beings uh, with individual uh, human qualities to them. In reality, though, regardless of what the law said, you can write a law, but that doesn't necessarily mean that it's going to be followed exactly. Because in reality, slaves were people. And that meant that they courted with one another, you know, courted in, in terms of like, um, you know, dated, I guess, if for lack of a better word, maybe we would call in modern day times. 
they fell in love, and they formed lasting unions with one another, and enslaved couples came together and remained together largely at the discretion of their owners. So this wasn't even behind the back of the slave owners. And remember, there's another reason for that, which is once again, slave owners are looking to encourage reproduction of slaves. And so they're okay with the idea of slaves entering into uh, mo monogamous relationships and, and raising kids and stuff. Slave owners were anxious for female slaves to reproduce and for male slaves to be tied down by family loyalties and generally encouraged their slaves to marry informally and may have even conducted the ceremonies themselves. Um, some slave owners, if they had particularly uh, a decent amount of wealth, would even host big slave weddings and hire preachers to lead the ceremonies. And such weddings were very popular amongst the slaves who regarded them as, as occasions to celebrate. Um, it, it, you know, for example, ex-slave Richard Mooring had very good memories of the weddings that were held on his master's North Carolina plantation. And so, you know, this is again, though, a very unusual kind of dynamic, right? Because um, it, we have to understand that the slave owner may have been doing this, um, but, it's, but we don't want to confuse it as doing it out of necessarily the kindness of their heart or spirit. Um, it, 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 there's a pragmatic reason, an economical reason uh, that, uh, that justified slave owners um, encouraging the marriage of their slaves. And so um, s now we have to understand also that these slave unions, despite the fact that they may have been either um, not, you know, minimally condoned or, or even more so supported by the slave owners, we have to understand that the slave unions lacked the sanctity and sometimes even the consensual character of white weddings of that time. Um, because because uh, in cases where uh, slave owners were particularly eager to encourage their uh, female slaves to start reproducing slaves, uh, sexual partners and indeed you know marriage partners uh, in the long run could be imposed on slaves in appallingly brutal and unjust ways. And the book describes a horrific and disturbing account of this uh, in the story of a woman by the name of Louisa Everett. And Louisa Everett was a slave um, whose marriage to her husband, Sam, began when her owner came into her cabin with this male slave named Sam, who was forced to undress in front of her. And the slave owner said, do you think you can stand this big N-word, okay? And um, the, the master had a bullwhip on his shoulder, which is the sign of, you know, it's, a, it's, it's brandishing a weapon. It's a sign of threat, right? Which is basically, you know, just out of fear, okay? Louisa said, yes, sir, I guess so. Because she didn't want to be whipped if, if she had even thought about saying no. And she then tried to hide her face so she could not see Sam's nakedness. But then the owner made her and Sam consummate this relationship in front of him. And this is uh, beyond perverse and obscene when it comes to uh, how some of these slave unions are instigated by the slave holders or slave owners. Another case was of Rose Williams that the book talks about, where a 16-year-old slave, she's 16, okay? She's still, she's still a kid, and she was told to share a cabin occupied by a slave named Rufus, whose sexual advances she did not welcome. But the own, and she went and she complained, complained to the owner, and the owner threatened to beat her if she did not have sex with Rufus. And so we need to understand that although these slave unions were sometimes mutual, um, that other times they were not mutual, and and that those stories are every bit as important because it it um, it goes to show just how vulnerable. African-American women were, particularly African-American female slaves were, 
uh, in terms of you know uh, sexual abuse or sexual coercion. So slave women, whether single or married, were very vulnerable to sexual abuse, and slave men could offer them very little protection from, from white men's sexual advances, which is another aspect of this that we need to be clear about, which is, of course, the many circumstances throughout the history of slavery where white men were propagating their own sexual violence against their slaves. Um, Harriet Jacobs was one example of this, where she was kept as a mistress by her white owner, who had turned away a free black carpenter who, who wished to marry Harriet, and, and then buy her freedom. And the slave owner refused to allow this, this freeman, this free black carpenter, to be able to marry Harriet and win her her freedom, you know, buy her freedom out. And so, um, one critic of slavery argued that one of the reasons why wicked men in the South uphold slavery is the facility which it affords them for a licentious life. If you don't, want, don't know what licentious means, it means given into sin. Licentious is, is um, you know, like it, it's um, profligate behavior where it's sexually deviant behavior or just behavior that's given into one's own sinful impulses. And um, so, and we have to be clear that that very much is a, is a truthful statement. That's not saying all slaveholders sexually abused or harassed their female slaves, but enough of them did where it is one of the stronger moral arguments as to why slavery needs to end. Now, not all slave families were the product of sexual coercion, of course. The marriages of slaves from different plantations, which were known as abroad marriages, suggest that many slave owners allowed slaves to choose their own partners. Because in this situation, this would be a situation where you had two different slaveholders who may have had, um, you know, who lived on different plots of land on different plantations, and the slaves from either of these plantations would marry one another. And these um, marriages may have accounted for up to about a third of all slave marriages in the mid-19th century. So this would seem to imply that there was some degree of, of choice, at least for some slaves, during the antebellum period. Abroad marriages required very strong commitment, though, because enslaved men had to secure their master's permission to be able to visit their wives. And then, when they were visiting their wives, they had to brave those slave patrols on the route to see them. So if they had to travel any distance between these two plantations uh, to visit their spouse, um, there was a good chance that they could have been seriously harassed uh, during, during that um, travel to go and see their wife. Adult slaves had very little control over the actions of their owners, but they did the best they could to shield their children from the same kinds of abuse that they witnessed all the time. So some, for example, uh, in order to try to shield their children from, um, uh, from enduring the wrath of the slave owners, some subjected their kids to physical punishment at home to try to mitigate the punishment that was administered by the slave owner. So if you punished your own kids, this was a way to hopefully demonstrate to the slaveholder, look, I've, I've punished them, you don't need to now punish them worse. Um, they also taught their children how to stay out of trouble and how to obey the owners at a very early age. They also taught them things like racial etiquette, such as stepping aside for white people and not doing anything that may irritate or alarm them. And we have to understand that this same philosophy, there's a conversation somewhere here to be had about the, the conversation that a lot of modern day African American parents have with their children which is the conversation about, um, you know, uh, for lack of a better word, how to interact with police officers, uh, you know, or, or particularly white police officers, but, but essentially just, all, just how to act with the police. Because there seemingly is something of a double standard about the way that um, African Americans are treated uh, by law enforcement in modern day times, 
uh, th than, than other uh, racial groups. And so um, these kinds of lessons, uh, these kinds of conversations that take place between um, African-American parents and their children uh, are not a new thing. And they go back a very long way to the very entrenched, uh, the very entrenched role of slavery in Southern society uh, in early America. Now, uh, moving forward, um, another story that the book talks about as we now start to move into the content of chapter six, which is now focusing our conversation away from the slave south and more towards the free north. Um, one might get a misleading representation of what it meant to be a free African American in the North because it certainly didn't mean that life was necessarily easier. Um, it, in many ways, life was actually more difficult for African Americans in the North despite the fact that they were no longer slaves thanks to the gradual emancipation period uh, from about 1790 until about 1820. So in January of 1849, Mary Ann Shad was a 25-year-old veteran school teacher who had benefited herself from um, being able to obtain a, a private education as well as her own family's political activism. And she met at a Congress, um, and she said, uh, not at, at the Congress of the United States, but at an African-American Community Congress, where she said, we have been holding conventions for two years, have been assembling together and whining over our difficulties and afflictions, passing resolutions on resolutions, but it does really seem that we have made but little progress. We should do more and talk less. And so um, after this, she left her teaching job in New York City and moved to Canada. And she took on a new teaching job. And she then became the co-founder of the Provincial, Provincial Freeman, which was a weekly black newspaper, devote, newspaper devoted to anti-slavery, temperance, and general literature. Marianne Shan, Shad attended the 1855 National Negro Convention in Philadelphia as only one of two female black delegates and gave a speech in favor of Canadian emigration because as the treatment of African Americans in the North continued to get worse, um, African Americans began looking for solutions that would um, allow them to escape the racial prejudice, discrimination, and violence that was taking place in many of the urban areas that black, black populations um, had, had been um, increasing in number. So liberation took many paths after 1830 when free blacks focused on building their own communities, on promoting moral reform, education, black unity to combat racial prejudice and discrimination, and black activists during this era of the 1830s, 40s, 50s strongly pushed abolition onto the national agenda as the issue of slavery began to threaten to tear apart the entire nation on sectional grounds between North and South. <clears throat> now, racial discrimination in the era of the common man. Um, by 1830, when we talk about this idea of the common man, we are entering into a period of time uh, in American political history where Andrew Jackson became president. During Andrew Jackson's presidency, Andrew Jackson was known as this kind of, this, this uh, hero, this war veteran, tough guy, and also common man. Now, we need to be clear that Andrew Jackson actually came from Kentucky and was himself a slaveholding family, but he came to uh, represent this ideal of the common man, particularly the common white man of the West. And when I say the West, again, I'm referring to the new, the, the old West, okay? Not the, not the like areas of Washington, Oregon, California. I'm more talking about the regions of Ohio, Indiana, Illinois, places like that. And so Jackson was often referred to as the hero of the West, right? And 
And in Jackson's presidency, white male Americans very much uh, valued Jackson as a hero of the common man who was looking out for, uh, you know, the everyday guy, uh, the everyday white guy, that is, of course. But what you'll find in this era of the common man in the Jacksonian period is that um, while slavery uh, existed almost exclusively in the South because New Jersey was the only northern state with a significant number of slaves. Um, in the period of the 1830s, 40s, 50s, African Americans um, faced increased, increased prejudice, increased discrimination, increased violence as a result of their racial identity, uh, the, the color of their skin being black. Um, so as, as gradual emancipation took hold, it had an inverse reaction of increasing uh, racial prejudices. Alexis de Tocqueville, who was the famous French traveler who went to Britain, and um, you may remember if you took AP European history, Alexis de Tocqueville, we always read a piece from de Tocqueville in the Industrial Revolution period. De Tocqueville was the one who went to England and said, um, from these filthy sewers, pure gold flows out, um, you know, uh, to enrich the rest of the world. And so he was talking about the egregious and deplorable um, living and working conditions of, of Manchester. But he also went to America. And Alexis de Tocqueville, as he went to America, noted that, quote, the prejudice of race appears to be stronger in the states that have abolished slavery than in those where it still exists. And nowhere is it so intolerant as in those states where servitude has never been known. Now, Alexis de Tocqueville was not an American historian, and he didn't realize that actually slavery was legal at some point in all colonies prior to the American Revolution. But when we talk about you know, the, the, the now free states of the United States of America in the North, even Alexis de Tocqueville in this time noted the absolutely, ab ab uh, you know, abysmally bad treatment of African Americans in the North. So the legacy of black enslavement and its associated racism shaped Northern black life as whites began creating structures of discrimination and repression to enforce black submission, all right? The expectation was that the white populations were dominant and the black populations were meant to be submissive. Whites in this time, regardless if you were in the North or the South, regardless if you were in a free or slave state, viewed blacks as just purely racially inferior. And there were a number of studies coming out during this time inspired by Charles Darwin and the theory of, of you know, survival of the fittest and these kinds of ideas, evolution, okay? And, and um, new uh, regions of study in the social sciences, in particular the early days of anthropology, you had researchers, and of course these re researchers were educated white males, okay, who began doing things like S Dr. Samuel Morton of Philadelphia did. Who, uh, this guy, Dr. Samuel Morton, collected human skulls from all over the world and began measuring them and classifying them according to race. And when he measured the skull cavities of different um, uh, types of humans from around the planet, he began proposing that Europeans had the most brain capacity and Africans had the least. One thing I was kind of surprised that the book didn't mention is the story of Blumenbach. If you've ever heard the story of Blumenbach, it's worth looking into because basically this researcher, Blumenbach, I forget his first name, was a researcher from Europe who decided to go all over the world, and by all over the world, I mean all over Europe, and, um, and look at peoples of different... Um, ethnic backgrounds. So he went to Northern Europe and he looked at the Scandinavians. He went to England. He looked at the English people. He went to France. He looked at the French people. He went to Italy. He looked at the Italian people. And then he went all the way over to Southeastern Europe, looked at Slavic folks, and went all the way over to um, the Caucasus Mountains. And he essentially determined through Blumenbach's studies he essentially published this paper where his major thesis was that the most beautiful people on the planet 
were, Caucas were from the Caucasus regions. And if you've ever heard of the phrase Caucasian, that's where that phrase comes from. It's a reference to Blumenbach's studies, referring to his thesis that the most beautiful people on the planet also happen to be the whitest people on the planet. And remember, he wasn't looking at Africa, Asia, Native Americans, Aboriginal Australians, or anyone else. So uh, his study was uh, certainly not um, you know, unbiased, we can say. Uh, but it, but it, none, studies like this, nonetheless, are used despite the fact that they are at best pseudoscience, meaning like not real science, all right? Beyond that, they are nonetheless used to reinforce pre-existing beliefs about race. All right, and we see it come to an even further extent in the later 1800s as we begin to see social Darwinism uh, used as a way to, um, to uh, as an avenue for, for example, the fascist regimes of the Nazis to promote, uh, you know, the extermination of the Jews and gypsies in Europe at that time, right? And so these kinds of, of, of social Darwinist ideas appear in the post-Civil War era, a little bit ahead of where we're at right now, but the, but the origins of it go back many, many decades before social Darwinism even really becomes a thing. And again, social Darwinism is, is yet another example of these pseudosciences of bloodlines and, and um, not genetics, okay, but eugenics. And eugenics sounds kind of like genetics, and you could see why people would think that a flashy word like that would be scientific, but eugenics is not based in any actual science. And if you uh, take a look at nowadays, we've mapped out the human genome. You could take two different people from opposite corners of the globe, and they're going to share like 99.9-some .9 percent of, of their DNA, okay? They're just, Homo sapiens sapiens does not, uh, does not differentiate based on race. All humans are humans, all right? And so um, racial discrimination of the, in the era of the common man, continuing this idea here, throughout America and Europe in the 19th century, scholars investigated and debated racial origins and character. And these early studies helped to justify the enslavement of African Americans and also fed no notions of white supremacy while fueling fears that free blacks are a problem population, particularly in the North where slavery has already been abolished in most states. Whites restricted African Americans' freedom and undermined black efforts for self-improvement through things like segregation and exclusion, particularly thanks to these black laws that existed even in free states and even in states where it had been forbidden for slavery to extend north or westward. So black laws discouraged or forbade blacks from entering or settling in Ohio, Indiana, and Illinois. Um, law enforcement officers routinely left black life, liberty, and property unprotected. And remember that these are free blacks who allegedly are supposed to be protected by the Bill of Rights in the Constitution, the first 10 amendments, okay? And, and, and that the benefits of life, liberty, property, the pursuit of happiness, and the government's role in protecting those things seemingly did not apply to black populations in this time, even those that weren't slaves. A white Cincinnati lawyer, Cincinnati, Ohio, okay, a white Cincinnati lawyer admitted to, admitted to Alexis de Tocqueville as de Tocqueville was, uh, you know, going across the American countryside and, and seeing what was there, that the lack of legal protection for local blacks often led to, quote, the most revolting injustices. And by the way, these revolting injustices still exist today, you know? And, and, and it's why you're seeing racial tensions uh, coming to a head in 2020. And I don't need to mention, of course, the George Floyd thing that happened over the summertime, uh, going all the way back to other examples throughout history as well. Much, much before Trayvon Martin in 2014. Okay, Trayvon Martin is kind of um, the, you know, the, it was kind of the signal flare for this new generation of, of brutality against African Americans or, or an unequal distribution of uh, rights 
to black American citizens, but it's, it's happened going back much farther than that. I encourage you guys to check out a documentary that was, it won Best Picture in the year 2001, uh, and it was, or Best Documentary Picture of 2001, and it's a documentary about the case of Brenton Butler, who were it not for the efforts of a particularly diligent and also really, really um, uh, compassionate defense attorney, not a police officer, not a detective, a defense attorney who, who read about ben, Brenton Butler's uh, case in the newspaper. And at first thought, oh, you know, another, here's another case of uh, a young uh, a black male youth who threw his life away by murdering someone, all right? And as he began to investigate this case and ask Brenton Butler questions, he starts to realize there is not a single possible way that Brenton Butler could have per committed this murder. And, and guys, I have been working with kids... I've been working with kids my whole life, you know, that were Brenton Butler's age. Brenton Butler was 15 years old when he was arrested in Florida uh, on accusation of, ca of murder charges. Okay, it was a capital murder case. And, um, and he didn't do it. He just simply do it. didn't do it. And, and you take one look at Brenton Butler, one look at him, and... You know, I understand that you can't always judge a book by its cover, but I took one look at Brenton Butler and I thought to myself, that's a good kid. All I had to do was look at it. Now, of course, I work with kids all the time, you know, and, and so I have a lot of experience there dealing with that segment of the population. It took me one second to look at Brenton Butler and say, that's a good kid. And, and I think that you'll have the same reaction. And this happened in, in 1999, you know, when I was in ninth grade. And it's a story that almost no one knows about. But it's a, it's a story that, that <laughs> it, it, it ended in, it, it, it ends good, okay? Brenton Butler is, is found not guilty. He doesn't go to prison. He doesn't get the death penalty. The point, though, is that I still don't feel like justice was done because he should have never been put in that position in the first place. Physical coercion happened. He was beaten by the police. Okay. He was interrogated without being given a phone call to, to talk to either his parents or a lawyer. And the police officers and detectives who were trying to pin this murder on Brenton Butler wrote his confession for him and coerced him into signing a confession. This stuff was happening. And you wonder how, you know it's not the only time that it's happened. But it's just simply not fair. It's not fair. And, you know, it, you look at situations that happen in modern times, okay? And, and I'm not saying that criminality doesn't happen. I'm not saying that I'm not saying black folks don't commit crimes. I'm not saying that white folks don't commit crimes. I'm simply saying that people shouldn't be accused of crimes they didn't commit purely because they happen to be black and in the wrong place at the wrong time. And I don't think that that's a radical position to take. I think it's a pretty human one. Um, so, you know, I, I encourage the name of that documentary, if you want to watch it, I... <laughs> I got to tell you guys, I've watched it. I have cried my eyes out watching that documentary because it is nothing short of absolutely powerful. And so it's called Murder on a Sunday Morning. Okay, Murder on a Sunday Morning is the name of it. Check it out. So um, blacks were imprisoned and still are imprisoned at far higher rates than whites for all kinds of offenses, but particularly in those days, the, the offenses could be real or imagined, and they could be major or minor. And racist views held blacks as prone to criminality. And so there was this prevailing attitude of, well, even if they didn't commit the crime, we're probably preventing a future crime from being committed just by way of associating criminality with blackness. 
For whites, this was the era of the quote-unquote common man, when universal white male suffrage became the norm after 1830. And that was one of the big things about the Jackson election, was that universal male suffrage had put Andrew Jackson in the position of the presidency thanks to the common man's vote. But in 1837, after 1830, black men increasingly lost the right to vote. They were disfranchised or disenfranchised, okay, meaning that the voting privilege was taken away from them. So in, it, this happened first in 1837 in Pennsylvania, which disenfranchised black men, and then every state that entered the Union after 1819, with the exception of Maine in 1820, prohibited black suffrage. Now, by 1860, black men could vote only in Maine, New Hampshire, Vermont, Massachusetts, and Rhode Island, but you have to remember that in those areas, even though blacks did have the right, black, black males, that is, had the right to vote in those regions, they only made up 6% of the populations in those states. Um, sorry, that's a duplicate slide. Okay. Now, uh, black political exclusion solidified white male supremacy. That is to say that when black men were excluded from the political process by having their right to vote taken away, this solidified m white male supremacy in politics. And it was a fear that black men were ignorant and untrustworthy, prone to criminality again, and that they would pollute the political system, okay? So, whites degraded blacks further beyond the political disenfranchisement by marginalizing them economically as well as politically. So, so not only are, peop are, are, are black men, men, well, when I say black people, I can't just refer to all, all African American communities at the same time in this era because no, no women, not even white women, had the right to vote at this time. Okay, uh, women don't get the uh, constitutional amendment to allow women to vote until 19, roughly 1920. And so, <clears throat> um, which again is kind of a crazy thing to think about that women have only had the right to vote for a century. Like there are people who are whatever, over 100 years old today. I don't know what the oldest person living is today, but there's literally people who are still alive on the planet today that lived in an era where women didn't have the right to vote, which is like mind blowing, right? Um, anyhow, free blacks were often in competition with poor whites and migrants from Europe. And this sometimes resulted in hostility and violence because the black population were viewed as not only inferior racially, but viewed as economic competitors to wage labor positions in the North. And so when you had Irish immigrants and German immigrants who began increasingly migrating to the United States in the 1830s and 40s and settling in the same urban areas in the North that black populations lived, the white migrant populations there competed with African Americans for low paying jobs. And so you saw racially motivated riots become more commonplace in this era, particularly in northern cities, where white mobs began attacking black neighborhoods, destroying property, even killing people, lynching people, hanging them, and things like that. All right, Cincinnati, the city of Cincinnati, Ohio, which is located very, very far south in Ohio. It's right across the Ohio River from Kentucky. And Cincinnati saw a series of riots as it was directly across that river and a common destination for fugitive slaves escaping the South uh, to, to, to move to, to, to emigrate to. So they wanted to move to Cincinnati because Ohio was a free state. And Cincinnati also became a very key position along the Underground Railroad uh, as um, you know, slave escapees attempted to, uh, you know, leave slavery and become fugitive slaves and move north. And so the black population of Cincinnati grew rapidly enough to alarm the whites that lived there. And by late June of 1829, local officials of Cincinnati announced that they would rigorously start enforcing Ohio's black laws and prohibiting black uh, populations from moving to Cincinnati. Meanwhile, in the city, white mobs began attacking blacks, and over the course of the summer, over half of the black population was driven away from Cincinnati, many of them relocating to Upper Canada. 
So we see these kinds of racial tensions uh, happening in these in these states that are allegedly, you know, free states where slavery has been outlawed, but nonetheless, African Americans in these free states face severe hardship when it comes to being welcomed as members of the community. Not, notwithstanding, Boston, New York, and Providence, Rhode Island also each experienced several anti-black riots throughout the years, but no place had more riots against black folks than Philadelphia, which had more riots than any other major city. There were riots in Philadelphia in 1820, 1829, 1834, 1835, 1838, 1842, and 1849, and each of them, okay, are years where riots broke out in Philadelphia, mostly targeting African American communities, but also sometimes targeting immigrant populations as well. Now, both poor and prosperous blacks were attacked in this. It's not just the lower uh, echelons of the economic uh, uh, hierarchy that are the victims of this, because there were wealthy, well-to-do free blacks who were attacked in these mobs as well. Uh, as were black and white abolitionists. So if you were a well-known abolitionist and had become you know, a, a, you know, a radical abolitionist like William Lloyd Garrison or another abolitionist by the name of Elijah P. Lovejoy, both of which who were white abolitionists who had been advocating for the immediate abolition of slavery, you too had a target on your head. And they targeted places of worship such as the African Presbyterian Church in Philadelphia. In Illinois, uh, further to the west, pro-slavery activists hurled the printing presses of a white anti-slavery newspaper, an abolitionist newspaper, into the Mississippi River. They burned down the entire print shop and then murdered Elijah Lovejoy, the editor of this paper, okay, this anti-slavery paper coming out of Illinois. And so, you know, these, there is a lot of hostility during this time. And, and the hostility was further stoked by, um, by this idea of nativism. Now, when we talk about nativism, nativism is a characteristic that goes uh, very, very far back in American history. Um, nativism was, was super profound during this period of time. What is nativism? Well, ironically, um, there was a group of white Americans, of course, mostly men, white Americans who, who had been born in America, that the reason it's ironic is because they begin calling themselves Native Americans. Now, of course, when they're using that term, they are not referring to what we think of today as Native Americans. They're referring to white English descendant Americans, okay? And they are very hostile towards migrant populations of both the Irish and the Germans, as well as African American populations. And these nativists who founded a, a political party, which almost, by the way, became the second major party uh, in the 1830s and 40s, was called the Know Nothing Party. And this was, an, this was a, the whole platform of the Know Nothing Party was this hateful nativist sentiment that was extremely anti-immigrant and also extremely anti-Catholic. And that's because, remember, that these British descendants were largely Protestant in their faith, either Anglican uh, in the early days or later on down the line, Puritan, and then other things as a result of the First and Second Great, Great Awakening, like Methodist or Baptist or Presbyterian or whatever. Okay, But it was extremely anti Catholic, and the reason it was anti-Catholic is because of the Irish, who were largely Catholic. That during the 1840s, there was a massive potato famine in Ireland that co that was wreaking havoc on the population, actually resulted in the deaths of people through starvation. And so Irish folks began leaving Ireland, and for a period of time, actually, there was more Irish people living in the United States than there was in Ireland. And so, um, you know, and even today, there's a lot of folks who have, um, you know, Irish, Irish background, okay? Uh, now, in this situation in the North, uh, because most immigrants were attracted to the urban areas of the North, very, very, very few immigrants uh, from Europe that were migrating to America during the 1830s and 40s were attracted to the South. Very, very few, because in the South there was slavery. A lot of um, migrants, particularly the German migrants, were against 
slavery in the first place, but also fearful of things like slave insurrections. And then two, remember, there's no real work in the South because of slavery. So it would have been really difficult to find work that where you would have been paid a wage by anyone in the South because they weren't paying their slaves any wages and they didn't want to hire um, European migrants. And so most European gr migrants came to the North, and that's why the nativist sentiments were much stronger in the North than they were in the South, is because they were the ones who were more regularly interacting with these migrants. So in this situation in the North, as most immigrants were attracted to these urban areas, both free African Americans and European immigrants faced severe prejudice, discrimination, and violence. It was not uncommon to see signs in businesses or in factories that said, um, you know, uh, looking for work, blacks and Irish need not apply. These kinds of signs were very, very, um, you know, commonplace in those days, and they are, of course, blatantly prejudicial and illegal in modern times, um, but very commonplace in those in, during the uh, know-nothing days, the uh, nativist days. The growth of the free black communities in the North, racial hostility, economic discrimination, political exclusion, and violence, all of these factors constrained the efforts of Northern free blacks to make a living or to improve their condition. The jobs available to black folks were usually unskilled type jobs. And this is a major problem because as the Industrial Revolution continues to kind of chug along throughout the 19th century, one of the byproducts of the Industrial Revolution is that it de-skillified the labor class. And the reason that that's significant is because a, a labor class that has no real working skills means that they have no ability to leverage any of their talents or skills against um, mistreatment. So if you were a particularly skillful, skillful worker or you had a particular skill set like masonry, masonry or carpentry or things like that, you had a little bit more leverage because your work was... It, not able to be done by just you know any old person. But as factories continue to proliferate, you don't need to have any skills to work in a factory. And that means that as a, as a working class population, migrants and African Americans, more so than other white populations at the time, faced the, the hardships de dealing with the vulnerability of not having any actual skills in the workplace. So the jobs available to black folks in the North were typically unskilled, and they also paid the lowest wages. And the work was also seasonal in a lot of cases, which meant that they could go through long periods of time throughout the year without employment. And if you're not being employed, of course, that means you're not making money. And if you're not making money, that makes it really difficult to survive in an economy that is increasingly transferring over to what we would now describe as a consumer-style economy, where people are no longer producing the food or clothing or shoes or tools that they need themselves, but rather purchasing these goods using money that they earn at some sort of wage labor type job. So between 1820 and 1860, the percentages and numbers of black men in skilled and semi-skilled jobs declined significantly as the jobs began, began increasingly going being given to native-born whites and also, over time, growing numbers of white immigrants as well. So between 1830 and 1860, here's an unusual um, <clears throat> statistic for you that may be hard to wrap your head around, but I'll try and describe it. Between 1830 and 1860, the U.S. population increased from 13 million to 32 million. Okay, so from eight, we're seeing significant population growth. Okay, the population's growing. It's doubling basically every 20 years. So, and nearly 5 million of that population in, increase were, was as a, as a result of Irish and German migrants coming over from Europe. So, and then the rest of it was as a, as a byproduct of natural reproduction. During this time, though, there were also, as the population was growing, there were also a number of significant economic downturns, downturns, great depressions. You guys might have, for example, learned about in AP US history, the Panic of 1837 or things like that. Okay, these kinds of economic downturns, the, the economy used to very predictably go through periods of growth and periods of recession and periods of depression. 
And we haven't had an economic depression since the Great Depression going back to um, the 1929 stock crash, stock market crash. But it used to be the case that depressions happened relatively frequently. And, and what this did was the, this, the, with these economic, with every economic downturn throughout the decades between 1830 and 1860, um, it further eroded the declining economic status of northern blacks as well. Um, now, black women formed a little over half of the population of black communities due to shorter male life expectancies, thanks to things like disease, overwork, or even just poverty from a lack, from a lack of work. Um, and so, the, and then too, you have to remember there was a consistent demand even in free states, uh, for black women as domestic servants. And in those situations, they wouldn't be slaves, they would be paid a wage. Um, but black women earned this um, reputation as being good house servants. And so there was that demand never seemingly went away. So black women actually had opportunities that men didn't have being domestic servants. And that might also explain their higher percentage in the population. Usually, the population's pretty evenly split 50-50 between men and women. But during this time, we actually see more African-American women than men as a result of the kind of work and life experiences uh, that they are subjected to. Overall, blacks had lo shorter life expectancies and higher death rates than whites due to work accidents because they're working in dangerous conditions, disease, and also lack of adequate health care. And so um, the other thing about African-American communities of this time is that they also had a higher infant mortality rate and tended to have, particularly in urban areas, fewer children. Now, why do they have fewer children in urban areas? There's a few reasons for that. Generally speaking, regardless of race, as urban populations tend to grow, uh, the number of children uh, birthed to urban couples goes down. And the reason for that is because space becomes a commodity, number one. So whereas if you were living on a farm and you had a lot of land available, having a bunch of kids doesn't overcrowd the situation. But if you're living in a tenement house, okay, essentially basically think of it like a you know fortified cardboard shack okay, that was prone to burning down in an urban area in the early days of the Industrial Revolution, um, you don't have a whole lot of space. And so having more kids takes up more space. Also, kids are expensive in urban areas. In rural areas and farming lands, kids become labor. You can put your kids to work on the farm. In urban areas, kids, you know, there are no farm jobs that kids need to perform. Laws had increasingly started to be passed in the 1850s pertaining to child labor. So kids couldn't go and work in factories at six years old anymore after that. And so what happens is families in urban areas tend to have fewer kids. But this was especially true for African American families. After 1840, urban black families in the north were smaller in size than rural black families in the north, as well as southern black families. But despite this, even despite all of these figures, the number of free blacks in the north continued to grow from natural increase. So even in spite of the various um, obstacles to health, health care, um, you know, adequate, uh, you know, education, um, and, and all of the efforts by uh, white northerners to undermine uh, black self-improvement. Um, despite all of this, the number of free blacks in the, north, in the North continued to grow from natural increase. In other words, uh, black couples having kids. And the migration of free blacks from the South as well contributed to growing populations in the North, as well as the arrival of escaped fugitive slaves. So by 1860, half of the nation's free black population lived in these northern urban areas. Um, 
Now, as a proportion of their, their communities, however, and this is where things get a little confusing, although these numbers are growing, as a proportion of their urban communities, the black population was shrinking comparative to the growth of white populations. So when we look at the overall population growth, the entire population is going up significantly during this time. But if we divide the population demographically by black population versus white population, the white population is proliferating much faster. Okay, the population of white segments of, of, of urban areas in the north are growing much more rapidly than black communities are. And this means that over time, black communities are going to make up a smaller and smaller percentage of the total population in those cities that includes everyone. And so in northern cities, black neighborhoods evolved nearby uh, but separate, f separate from white neighborhoods, cities uh, at this time tended to be pretty small and densely settled, and blacks found themselves crowd into, crowded, crammed rather, into lofts, garrets, and cellars in back alleys, I should say back alleys, and narrow courts. Okay, some neighborhoods were racially diverse, uh, where you had blacks living among poor and working class whites, particularly um, white immigrants. Okay, there are some neighborhoods of various urban regions in the north, Philadelphia, New York City, Boston, and so on, uh, where you do see some racial diversity. Um, and, and then you also had some situations where you had affluent blacks who lived in predominantly white areas, okay, but you know, there were also far more white neighborhoods that were completely closed off to them. So although it did happen sometimes where you saw affluent black folks living predominantly in predominantly white areas, there were even more white neighborhoods that uh, black folks did not have access to. And uh, that reminds me of something that I wanted to bring up uh, to you today. I recently watched on, um, I recently watched on Netflix, um, Let's see here, PBS, Jim Crow of the North. Um, you should watch this. You can find it on YouTube. Um, let me see if I can find the YouTube link. I think it was on, maybe it was on Netflix. Um, let's see here. Uh, Jim Crow of the North. And here it is. And I, I really, I would love for you guys to watch this. It takes place in my hometown of Minneapolis, Minnesota. And Minneapolis, Minnesota is not known uh, to be, you know, necessarily, um, you, know, it, you know, Minnesota was always a free state, for example. It, it doesn't have a long history of slavery like the South does or anything like that. Minneapolis was in the North, okay? But there was still extreme racial prejudices that took place within the bounds of the legal system. Uh, and and so I, here, let me dump this in here right now. Um, it should be that one. Let's double check and make sure that that links you to the right thing. Oh, I guess I can't do it while I'm streaming right now. But anyhow, um, so hopefully this comes back here. Okay, so I guess I can't do that while I'm while I'm streaming. But anyhow, uh, so but I do encourage you to watch it. It's really fascinating. It's only an hour long, and it's really, really, really interesting. And I think it goes to show you how the racial discrimination of African Americans really started um, spilling over into property ownership and the effect of real estate and how and how home ownership. Um, it was, you know, was uh, such a key factor for African American communities um, in terms of self improvement and um, an economic ap uh, opportunity and so on, and how. Uh, and how real estate, the system of real estate, was very much rigged against African American populations, even in a city in the North uh, like Minneapolis. All right, and of course, Minneapolis, as you all know, was the location of uh, the George Floyd murder. Now, um, you know, most black neighborhoods, it, when we're t looking at the general population of African-American neighborhoods in these urban areas, they tended to be crowded, they lacked clean streets, and they also lacked public services such as fire or police. 
And beyond that, of course, if they lack those kinds of public infrastructure types th type of things, it's going to be there's going to be poor sanitation, okay, which results in disease, okay. And these area, it, the poor sanitation in these areas was one reason that life expectancies were shorter for blacks than for whites. So although the economic and physical security of black communities generally declined from 1830 to 1860, some individual families and, and uh, individuals and families ended up succeeding in pulling themselves out of poverty, often by establishing small businesses that grew. So if we're looking at the totality of the population, the vast majority of people experienced a decline in their general you know, security, both physical and economic security, as well as political disenfranchisement. Okay, But there were a handful of individuals and families that succeeded in pulling themselves out of poverty from the African-American community. One example of that would be the Fortin family of Philadelphia. And this was a, a successful black family that improved their condition in a time when they saw so many other black families whose conditions were worsening. Uh, so James Fortin, who was a second generation free black, purchased a sail loft from the man with whom he had apprenticed. And by the 1830s, he had a sail making business that was highly respected and very prosperous, even hiring 20 to 30 employees under him. So Fortin became a wealthy man who was able to give his next of kin, his, both his daughters as well as his granddaughters, a good education. And um, even his daughters and granddaughters ended up going on themselves to become teachers and active abolitionists, as well as advocates of this notion of something that became known as uplift during the 1840s and 1850s. And uplift was this pop, was this idea that was particularly popular among the black elite of the time um, because they, you know, they had the advantage of being success stories of kind of like pulling themselves up by the boot, their bootstraps and um, finding a niche and becoming successful. So they put this emphasis, you know, on black self-help, black leadership, black autonomy as being necessary to elevate the race as a whole within these urban communities in the North. Free blacks who prospered in this antebellum period usually came from families that had been free for more than one generation. Remember, James Fortin was a second generation free black. It was much more difficult, in other words, for newly freed blacks or fugitive slaves who were technically not free but had escaped to the north to be able to pull themselves up by their bootstraps, so to speak, and create conditions that would have enabled them to increase their position in um, the socioeconomic standing of these areas. And so the success of black entrepreneurs, usually also the other side of this is that it's not like white folks were excited to see wealthy, prosperous um, black uh, individuals or families uh, elevating themselves because now you draw the ire of envy or jealousy, particularly of white folks who look at their own condition and say, look at me, I'm not even, you know, I, I'm white and I don't even have a business that that's, suc that's successful. And there's very much this, this idea of um, to take a line from another outstanding film, although it's just a movie, it's not like a documentary, although it is based on a true story. Of uh, it's, a, it's a movie that was made in about 1988, I'll say, and it's called Mississippi Burning, and it stars Willem Dafoe and Gene Hackman, and it's about the civil rights era in the South in Mississippi in the 1960s. And it's uh, Gene Hackman and, and Willem Dafoe play FBI agents who uh, go down to the South to investigate uh, uh, two missing white men and one missing black man uh, who were civil rights ag advocates that were slain in um, hate crimes in the South during the civil rights era. That's what the movie's about. But in the movie, Gene Hackman tells a story about um, his father who grew up in the South. And... Um, he tells a story about how his his um, his neighbor was a black man who had uh, a, a, a really really nice horse. Okay, a really nice horse, a really expensive nice horse. And one day the horse turns up dead, 
and um, Gene Hackman's, as he's telling the story, he says that his his father's explanation as to why the horse went missing was essentially, um, well, uh, if you're not better than a black man, who are you better than? And this is very much the attitude of, um, you know, relatively uh, poor off whites who witness um, the, the elevation of specific certain uh, black individuals or families in the North, which is not to, uh, you know, approach that situation with applause or, or gratitude or uh, celebration, but instead to approach it with jealousy, envy, and, um, and hatefulness. Uh, as as a as a um, as a problem of of identity uh, dealing with race, and so the success of black entrepreneurs attracted the animosity of whites generally, and successful communities of African Americans were often the victims of violence. And one of the best examples of that is Seneca Village. Seneca Village was in Upper Manhattan, and it was a thriving black community in the 1830s and 40s. It had churches, it had schools, it had businesses, it had cemeteries. It attracted wealthy blacks, it attracted poor blacks, it, att it attracted escaped slaves from the South. And in 1857, city officials raised Seneca Village, Village to the ground. They burned it to the ground in order to build Central Park over it. So that brings us to the end of today's lecture. And, um, you know, uh, we are hopefully now beginning to uh, wrap our heads around a little bit of the connections uh, that we see baked really very much right into the bread of uh, American society going back to the pre-Civil War days. And to close out my lecture today, in the last little bit, I'd like to tell you a story of my own. You know, when, when I was a kid, a couple of different things. When I was a kid, um, you know, my, my dad, <clears throat> my dad passed away a number of years ago, but my dad grew up in a segregated South. Um, so my dad was born in November of 1952. And um, this was a time where um, Jim Crow was still very much in place. Um, my dad, uh, you know, did not grow up racist. One of the earliest memories that my dad told me the story a million times uh, when he was still alive, he told me the story about how one time uh, he grew up in Georgia and um, they went to a hardware store. My dad and his dad, my grandfather, went to a hardware store. And um, super hot day, no air conditioning. And um, my dad went to the back of the store where there were water fountains. And there was a white water fountain that was in working order and in clean condition. And then there was a black water fountain that was out of order and dilapidated. And my dad went back to his dad and um, after, he, after he got a swig of water. And even as a child, my dad was only six or seven years old at this time. Even as a child, he thought to himself how unfair it was um, to be thirsty on a hot day in Georgia and not be able to go and get a drink of water. And, and it's, it's that attitude, um, that, that human attitude, to understand what somebody else would feel in that same scenario where you're hot and you're thirsty and all you want is just a cold drink of water. And then not to be able to have one simply because the color of your skin is different. So that's one story. But I'll tell you another story, and it's, it's going to seem like it doesn't relate, but it very much does. You know, I said to you a moment ago the idea of things being baked right into the bread of American history. When I was uh, growing up, my dad uh, was, was a, essentially a chain smoker. My dad smoked cigarettes. <clears throat> and um, my folks were divorced, 
And I tell this story in my, in my American history class towards the end of the year, but I think it's worth talking to you about. Uh, my folks were divorced, and on weekends, my sister and I, we would go over to my, my dad and stepmom's place. My dad ended up getting remarried. And my stepmom, my dad's second wife, was a phenomenal cook, okay? A phenomenal cook. And ev every weekend when my sister and I would go over there, Sandy, my stepmom, would make us all sorts of, you know, cookies, brownies, you know, other food, you know, dinner food, pork chop, you name it, whatever, okay? But a lot of times she'd make us baked goods. And Sandy, being this unbelievable cook, I mean, you'd sink your teeth into these cookies and it would just be heaven, okay? Um, and, you know, unlike anything you buy in the store, just phenomenal. And she would always give my sister and I, um, you know, a Ziploc bag or a Tupperware container with a whole bunch of cookies in it to take home when we, got, when we went back to my mom's house at the end of the weekend. And my sister and I would always take those cookies home. And we'd open them up, say, like on the next day after school. We'd come home and, you know, Sandy's cookies would be waiting for us at home on Monday afternoon. And you open it up and you take a bite of the cookie. And the first thing that you taste is cigarettes. And the reason is because my dad was such a chain smoker that when we were at my dad's place and you started to get used to the smell of cigarette smoke, you couldn't taste it. You'd eat the cookies and you were desensitized. But the cookies were baked while my dad was smoking in a smoky environment. And it permanently altered the flavor of the cookies so that when we left that environment and we went back to my mom's house where my mom was not a smoker and we bit into the cookies, the first thing that you tasted was the cigarette smoke. Why do I tell this? What's the point of this story? It has to do with understanding that in our modern day times, the things that we're witnessing surrounding racial injustice, police brutality, this, folks, is the smoke baked into the cookies of American history. And we, can all, we are all tasting the smoke in the cookies today. And we have an option. We can ignore it and continue to pretend that the cookies taste fine. Or we can start to bake a new batch of cookies. Have a great day.